Thank you, Mark. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Uh, I, I cover a lot of uh, stuff about freight transportation domain, and I think most of the students here don't get a chance to learn much about that. Uh, and uh, so I can't possibly give you a, enough education on it in a short period. But uh, I'm leaving my slides here. I'm leaving the paper behind this. And you're welcome to follow up uh, with questions if, if you're interested. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, all the imports of goods that are manufactured in the Far East and consumed here uh, in North America, uh, and in particular about uh, the, the amount that passes through the San Pedro Bay ports, which are the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which is really one port with a dotted line in the middle where the city boundary is. Uh, and so collectively, they're called uh, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are called the San Pedro Bay ports. And uh, they account uh, for 51% of the waterborne containerized imports from the Far East to the USA. And of course, 51% of the population doesn't live in Southern California. So that might seem strange that so much goes there. But I'm going to kind of explain why that makes sense uh, and why it's a big problem and what we, I think we ought to try to do about it. Now, of course, uh, there's uh, plenty of smart people in Southern California, and there's been efforts to try to uh, accommodate this huge volume uh, and many things. Uh, first, there was the development of being able to take containers uh, that arrive at a marine terminal and put them on trains uh, and take the trains right out of the port so that we don't have to drive these uh, imports around. That's the so-called on-dock rail. The first one in those ports was in 1982. Uh, and this has been gradually increasing to where every marine terminal uh, will have on-dock rail. There's still a few that don't, but their uh, uh, transformation is, is happening, and it, it, it accounts for it. Uh, the capability is it will be virtually will be all in, of their terminals very soon. Uh, and then uh, before there was on-dock rail, sorry about the spacing here. I guess the computers don't agree about where the carriage return. Uh, at any rate, there is also a, a near-dock rail facility called the ICTF, uh, which is a, a short truck trip, or what we call a dray trip, for a short around an urban area daytime truck trip. It's called a dray. Uh, that was opened in 1986. Uh, to try to reduce the emissions from the vessels, uh, uh, the ports had a program of requiring the vessels to slow down when they were about 30 miles out. and that reduce the emissions from that vessels burn very low grade oil and are tremendous polluters. Uh, in 1983, I wrote the first proposal uh, and did the first operational analysis for what became known as the Alameda Corridor. I stayed involved until uh, to get the EIR completed for uh, over a 10 year period. And after that, the LA engineering sharks took over involvement in it. But this is basically uh, a 25 mile totally grade separated railroad right away uh, from the ports up to connections uh, with the mainline railroads in downtown LA you can see in the distance there. Uh, and it only took 2.7 billion dollars in 19 years to cut the ribbon from my report but as public works go I guess that's pretty good nowadays. Uh, and then uh, uh, the biggest pollution source associated with, with the ports, ironically, was just the vessels sitting there, which would continue to steam away to power the boats and the cranes and so forth. Uh, and so it's been a program of shifting to shore power. Uh, and that's rather complicated because uh, the vessels use uh, 480, not 120, and not 240. So they had to have all kinds of electrical infrastructure. And gradually, all the terminals are getting uh, converted so that we can have what they call cold ironing and the boats are shut off while they're, they're in the port. Uh, the Pier Pass program was started in 2005 to have kind of congestion pricing. And so if you come in with a dray to pick up your box, uh, if you do it uh, during the second shift, uh, it's free. But if you come in during the day, you have to pay 100 bucks. Uh, and that's to try to uh, get the traffic out of, out of rush hour. Uh, and then the state, the uh, Ports had a clean truck program where they offered low interest loans to all the draymen uh, to trade in their dirty old tractors uh, for uh, CNG tractors that uh, polluted much less. 
Uh, and uh, so basically, there's a fleet of 10,000 uh, uh, CNG dray tractors serving the ports now. Uh, and then most recently, uh, they've gone to try to uh, clean up uh, the crane handling equipment. Uh, as I'll talk about, there are both rubber tire gantry cranes and what we call top pickers or top handlers. Uh, and now there are some uh, electric top handlers and, uh, running one terminal and there'll be uh, more coming. Okay, uh, now from the time I wrote the proposal for the Alameda Corridor, uh, supply chains have changed a lot. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and this has been driven by the changes in retailing in the United States to where we have uh, first the big box retailing taking share from the small mom and pop retailers, and then we have the big growth of e-commerce firms like Amazon. Uh, and the way that supply chains they're able to practice are different. Uh, and I'll show, elaborate on this more in a moment, but push supply chains is where uh, before we pick up the phone to call the steamship line, we decide where a container of imports is going to go in the United States, and we buy transportation all the way from the factory in the Far East to some inland distribution center and essentially push the goods on them whether they need it or not. In the push-pull supply chain, we only push it as far as uh, the port of entry, like San Pedro Bay, uh, but we, don't, haven't, we didn't decide uh, where the goods are going to go yet. Uh, and then once it gets here, we reassess the situation uh, and probably uh, de-van the goods from the marine container and reallocate them uh, and create domestic loads, uh, and so the contents of that one marine container end up in many places uh, to balance inventory. And so we can manage inventory much better that way. Uh, but the thing about these push-pull supply chains is that this generates a tremendous amount of truck or dray traffic in the LA Basin. Uh, it becomes uh, a big uh, social problem, uh, and which I want to address. Here, here's kind of a pictorial display of a push supply chain. Uh, the circles here are ports, uh, uh, like you can see San Pedro Bay in Oakland, and then up to Seattle, Tacoma, Vancouver, Prince Rupert, and then uh, through the canal around to Texas or Florida or the East Coast. And the triangles you can think of like regional distribution centers. So a Target or a Walmart or a Home Depot will have RDCs spread across the region, and they will, over, each night, they will supply their stores but hold most of the inventory at those triangles. Uh, so if we're doing the push supply chain, we generally try to find what's the cheapest transportation path to each triangle. Uh, and that usually means we use lots of water transportation and it means we use lots of ports of entry to minimize the land side transportation. Uh, so the push things are coming in uh, through uh, all the ports of entry uh, to serve the nearby triangles. Question, do the, so the, in the case of the triangles, do all the suppliers say Walmart, um, Safeway, all, all, the, all the companies that would typically have these distribution points, would they self-assemble in this triangle area? or They're, they're exclusive networks. So each big company has their own network of warehouses, and, and they don't share. And so when you put a triangle, is it an area of high concentration of such warehouses? Or Well, sure. I mean, you can see, like, uh, I have one in Dallas, and one in Houston, and one in Kansas City, and one in Denver. And that Denver one's going to supply a huge area because of very low density around it, right? And so they may have very big truck tri tri trips to set. And this is uh, very typical. You can think of it, there's on the order typically of 20 to 30 of these spread across North America. And they're kind of where they found low cost property and it's a relative good centroid for serving the stores in that region. So like here in the Bay Area are RDCs for Northern California. There's a cluster by Tracy, a cluster by Lathrop, a cluster by Woodland. Uh, these are places where there was commercial development of large warehouses that they could rent or buy. Uh, this is uh, the other extreme where instead of uh, telling the steamship line, uh, you know, send this box to this triangle, they just, we just tell the steamship line, well, just take everything to L.A. and I will pick it up at the port. Uh, and then once it gets here, we now run our computers and query the inventory levels at the various triangles and the sales rates in those regions and see what's the best reallocation of the stuff. And if we have more coming in than we need, then we'll just sit on it in an import warehouse in Southern California. 
So compared to the other system, this I can manage inventory very tight because uh, now the lead time from shipping from Southern California anywhere is like zero to 10 days, not one to two months. Uh, and I get a chance to rebalance. But I'm also spending a huge amount on transportation because everything comes to LA and then it's land side transportation everywhere. A compromise strategy is the so-called uh, four corners. There are some companies that do five corners, some that do three. Uh, but now we make, uh, I've illustrated the four corners where we use Seattle and San Pedro Bay and Savannah, Georgia and New York, New Jersey. And uh, we make a four-way split before we call the steamship line to leave Asia. Uh, but then we have pooled a bunch of triangles and assigned them to each of the corners. And then, so as the boat is getting close to that port of entry, we query our warehouses and figure out how we're going to split open the containers and, and reallocate the goods and balance our inventories. So this is, it doesn't have as big a transportation cost as we, uh, if everything came to LA, uh, but it has a bigger transportation cost than the push supply chain. Uh, because we're still we're doing more land side, you can see, uh, and then uh, uh, so it, it's kind of a, you know, and it doesn't have as much inventory savings as if we consolidated everything in LA. And so for different types of goods, these three different strategies make sense. For really expensive ones, the best thing to do is everything in LA. For moderate value goods, <coughs> three, four, five corners is best. And for really cheap stuff where we don't care how much inventory we have, then the push supply. And I won't go through the map behind all of that, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way it is, and that, that's the way it, 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 it turned, you know, it's practice. I, and that was not the case back in the 1990s. This really, these modern supply chain and managing inventory electronically like this and reallocating was something that started growing in the 90s and has grown and grown and grown, and that's in turn created more and more traffic for Los Angeles. Even in the four corners here, you can see how many triangles are assigned to Los Angeles, and that's because the land side transportation rates are cheaper if you do it that way. Okay, so let's play a little follow the box starting at a factory, say, in China or Vietnam. Uh, and uh, uh, we pick up the phone and call the steamship line and make a reservation for a vessel that's going to leave two weeks later. And they send it, uh, you know, maybe a week before to come up or less and pick up our, our boxes. And then they're on the boat coming across the pond. Uh, and when they get here, uh, maybe uh, one of the boxes we drop on a dray, on a dra and you see the box on a chassis is in the dray tractor, and maybe it's going to our RDC in Southern California, uh, say in the Inland Empire, uh, and then we have our own fleet of in-house trucks to go supply the stores every night to replenish the stores. So we, we, we only need enough in the stores to survive one day because we can replenish from our RDC. My red arrows indicate a marine box moving around, our yellow arrows indicate uh, either in-house trucking or dedicated contract service, uh, you know, where the, the, the drivers are just like making a move from warehouse to stores every day. Uh, then uh, if we have a box that's going to RDCs in inland regions, uh, then um, the, the ocean carriers sell a, they sell a door-to-door -door service and subcontract with the railroad to haul their marine containers inland, and then we have uh, a dray pickup at an inland railroad terminal, and then it goes to the RDC. So if we're going to Chicago or Dallas or Houston, it gets off the vessel, gets on a train, goes to a railroad terminal in those cities, and then is drayed there. And then after that, the supply chain looks the same. They're supplying the stores in that region. There's another kind of supply chain where uh, it looks like it was just a load to a regional distribution center. We see the box get on a dray. Uh, but it doesn't go to an RDC. It goes to what we call a cross-stock facility, uh, which is just sort of a, a warehouse with a massive amount of doors cut into it. And on one side, they'll be backing up all kinds of marine containers. And on the other side, they'll be backing up domestic vehicles. And there'll be all kinds of people running around the dock, uh, taking all the cartons out, sorting them, and putting them in the outbound. Uh, and so now I have blue arrows for domestic vehicles, either domestic containers or domestic trailers, meaning they don't go overseas. They stay here uh, in North America. Uh, and uh, from the cross dock, uh, some of them might, after the contents, maybe just taken to 
uh, an import warehouse if we're a retailer or a national distribution center if we're an original equipment manufacturer uh, uh, and others and then later on that place will generate other domestic loads and then from there they may be uh, going to the local RDC uh, or they may be going to the railroad yard and then going on a domestic container train to RDCs and other regions uh, and then after that, it's the same thing, the supply chain is supplying the stores overnight. So the difference is between the port and the RDC, what's happening. Now, the top one's pretty simple to understand, where the marine containers are going to the RDCs. That's the push supply chain. Uh, and then where we're devanning the contents, either at a cross dock or an import warehouse, and then generating domestic shipments is the push-pull, because at that port of entry, we get the chance to reallocate what, how much goes to each RDC. Um, when you think of it from the importer's point of view, and they're setting up uh, this transportation, uh, how they use the railroad depends upon whether they're doing that push or the push-pull. If it's in the IPI channel, they buy the door-to-door -door service from the ocean carrier, who in turn subcontracts uh, an origin train in Asia to go pick up the load at our factory, take it down to the boat, and then they contract with the railroad to take it from the port to a distant railroad terminal and then they contact with a destination drayman to take it from there to the where our warehouse. When they do the transloading channel, and the push-pull, uh, the importer only does business with the ocean carrier as far as the port of entry, the marine terminal there, and say, I'm going to come and pick up the boxes. And then he hires a drayman to go to the port and take that to the cross dock, which is probably run by a third-party logistics firm. Uh, and then for the outbound loads, they hire done business with an intermodal marketing company, uh, which has uh, rates from the railroad uh, and in also has arrangements for an origin drain and a destination drain. Uh, so you can see that the difference where, you know, for the marine box going inland, the ocean carrier is selling the whole transportation, whereas in the other one, there's four different parties the importer buys service from. Now, the reason I distinguish between marine containers and domestic containers is that uh, our truck sizes allowed have increased over the years. Back in, in 1982, uh, 40 foot was the same size for both marine and domestic. Uh, but then we had 45 in the mid 80s, and then 48 in the later 80s, and then 53 starting in the early 90s. Uh, and so, now our domestic vehicles are not 40 feet long, but they're 53 feet long. They're also higher and wider. Uh, so whereas the marine box holds 2,700 cubic foot of imports, our domestic boxes hold 4,000 cubic feet. Uh, and if you do the math, you find out that the contents of three of the international boxes will fit into two of our domestic boxes, uh, which means it's a big reduction uh, in dray trips and, and so on. Uh, and then if, then if you start, if you're shipping mixed cartons, not all the same size carton, but you have a bunch of different goods you're pack, packing in there, then you have a lot of edge losses inside that cube, a lot of space. And so the importers bringing in mixed cargo say that their ratio is actually closer to five to three. Five, the contents of five marine mixes fit in three. This train here, you can see some standard marriage marine boxes on the bottom, and then these are the 53. You can see now they're wider and they're taller and bigger. If you took one of our domestic boxes over to Rotterdam or to Hong Kong and got off the boat and drove out uh, the second street corner you come to, you will crash. Okay? Our infrastructure was built much later in North America than the old cities in Europe and Asia. Uh, and so we have a larger loading gauge. We can do much bigger vehicles. Uh, the other big difference compared to the rest of the parts of the world is that uh, we engineered railroads to haul freight, and passenger was a byproduct. Uh, everywhere else engineered railroads to haul people, and freight was a byproduct. So our trains are enormous, our freight trains. Their freight trains are tiny. Uh, this is a train of all 40-foot marine boxes coming into the port of Oakland uh, up by Pinole. Uh, and if you look under the rainbow out there, you see this train is still coming. There are 400 more than 400 boxes, marine boxes, on this train, two guys. Not 400 drivers, two guys. 
If you adjust for the standard of living, the cost of freight transportation in the United States using rail is cheaper than in China, where the wages are you know, 1 to 10 ratio. That's amazing. This is why. This is a train of the 53-foot domestic containers coming around the Tehachapi <laughs> Loop, uh, where they maintain a steady grade to get over the Sierras going east. Uh, there's only 300 boxes on this train, but if you consider the cube, this is actually hauling more freight than that marine train with 400 boxes. Okay, well, if we have that two to three ratio, uh, then uh, if we transload to the bigger boxes, then at the other end in Chicago and Dallas and Houston and Atlanta, uh, there's one-third less truck trips from the rail terminal to the warehouses. Uh, and if you check out the weight of the trains, uh, the weight of the boxes and the weight of the well cars and so forth, uh, if you're hauling FEUs, 40-foot equivalent unit, 40-foot containers, the way most imports are, uh, the train weighs 2.6 tons less. So if you have a train of 400 containers, this is a, you know, 1,000 tons less dead weight. Uh, and the train is able to haul 17% more imports per unit train length. Uh, and so you know, trains are, on most lines, basically limited by length. So this means you know, we can haul the imports with 17% less trains if we switch to the bigger boxes. So putting all of those things together, uh, if you think about it in terms of environmental friendliness and total emissions, uh, getting out of the little marine boxes and getting into our big boxes is less emissions. It's much better overall supply chain for planet Earth, uh, but the downside is it's very bad for the LA Basin. Okay, so uh, Push-pull supply chains are now up to 52% of the imports to San Pedro Bay. They were less than 40% in 2001. Uh, and they account for more than 80% of the emissions from import supply chains. Uh, and they're going to continue to gain share because uh, they're the supply chain for an Amazon or for a Walmart. Uh, and the push supply chains, which were good for the mom and pop, they're going away. Uh, and uh, so we have this huge and growing number of dray trips in the LA Basin. And, you know, as we favor push-pull, that's, that's pulling stuff away from the other ports and putting it in Southern California, right? Because this is the right, so Amazon will, would, wants everything in LA. They don't want the stuff all over the other place because they'd rather sell it to you and you pay for the transfer. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, four strategic initiatives to try to uh, cope with this and get the emissions down a lot. Uh, you know that uh, the state uh, CARB and others, they put out proposals to ask for things to you know, reduce emissions and help the state get to our goals of uh, reducing CO2 and so forth. And, uh, you know, and I occasionally put in something where I'm talking about I, I want to change the supply chains around it, and it it's always falls on deaf ears. Uh, they're only interested in technology, cleaner trains, cleaner trucks. That's the kind of thing they understand reduce emissions. And the, the idea that you just by monkeying with the supply chains, you can change, reduce emissions is it blows their minds. So, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, freight transportation is sort of out of sight, out of mind, even for our elected officials and, certain, and staff, and unfortunately, even for students at Berkeley. Uh, and that's not good. I mean, we, you know, we, 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 we need to understand this stuff. Okay, so let me talk briefly about data sources. Uh, you can buy a subscription to the U.S. Customs data, uh, and so I've occasionally had research sponsors which would uh, put in the cost if you want. Uh, uh, I think about uh, four months of, of data on just far east of U.S. is about $18,000. Last time I did this was 2015. I might be out that year. I might be able to do it again pretty soon. Uh, but there were uh, 7 million records. Uh, and what each record shows is uh, what country uh, this box came from, what's the declared value of the contents, where the importer says, uh, I paid this much for the goods, and I paid this much for the transportation to get it to wherever it's going. 
And that's the amount that customs will assess a duty on. Uh, and then uh, how much uh, volume it is, you can think of it like fractions of 40-foot containers. Some containers have mixed commodities. I didn't mention the commodity, but of course there's different uh, duties on different commodities. There are 99 commodity codes customs has that have different rules. Who the importer is, and then there's a field for the destination of the container, uh, but it turns out to be utterly useless. Uh, is that, you know, all we really need to know is what commodity it is and how much and what the declared value is, right? So then we can assess the right duty. So they didn't police this. So if you look in their records and find out what's the number one destination for imports from the Far East to the U.S., it says Hong Kong. And the number two destination is San Juan, Puerto Rico. These are where the billing offices are. It has nothing to do with where the box is going. So there's no data from customs about where the imports are going. Uh, but fortunately, uh, uh, the ports have shared all their information from me. The Maritime Association, which the marine terminals belong to, and the ocean carriers. Uh, the railroads have been very helpful, and the Intermodal Association of North America. And with a lot of work in uh, solving uh, equations and so forth, I was able to piece it together. So in 2015, 21.3% uh, of the containerized imports were locally consumed, and local, I mean, uh, anywhere in Southern California, Southern Nevada, Southern Utah, anywhere in Arizona, New Mexico, and portions of Colorado. The local region served by the RDCs in the Inland Empire. A uh, little bit less than 5% trucked up to Northern California. 36.5% uh, in marine box getting on a train. Uh, and 37.4% uh, it's generating uh, domestic container shipments after trucking around the basin and handling it. Uh, now, some of you may be familiar with the L.A. Basin and some of you may be not, so let me give a, a, a little uh, context for the intermodal geography of the basin. Uh, so the San Pedro Bay ports are down there, Long Beach on the right, L.A. on the left. Uh, and uh, it, historically, Los Angeles was not a port. Uh, it was, you know, San Francisco was the port. Uh, uh, and so the railroads were not built to the port area. They were built to where downtown L.A. is. Uh, and then there were branch lines crawling through the get barrios and neighborhoods down to the ports uh, where the trains would crawl along up 10 miles an hour. And every one mile, there's another 100,000 ADT street to cross and so forth. Uh, so we solved that problem with the Alameda Corridor. They had the grade separated railroad from the ports so the trains could get up uh, to the mainline railroads uh, without the urban Im impacts. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Okay, around the ports, there are a lot of warehouses, uh, but they were not built for the ports. There really wasn't a lot of containerized traffic in the ports if you go back to even the 1970s. Uh, and instead, what it was built for is from Long Beach up to the LA airport there by Inglewood is where our military aerospace industry all the systems integrators, the General Dynamics and Northrop's and Lockheed's and McDonnell Douglas uh, and Boeing and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, they would do the final assembly of the rockets and missiles and tanks and so forth, but they wouldn't want to invest in permanent manufacturing facilities because they were all bidding to the Pentagon. It wasn't clear who was going to get it. So this spawned a cottage industry of all kinds of specialty machine shops in the L.A. Basin that would make beryllium gears and all this fancy fence gear, and then as this would get completed, it needed to be put in warehouses waiting for other parts until we had enough to do the final assembly. So there were lots of little warehouses built in that whole region around the ports. They're not useful for the large big box retailers or the Amazons. They're much too small. They were perfect for inbound logistics for mom and pop machine shops. Uh, but mo most of them have, as the defense industry has gone now, they've been mostly converted to cross docks, which does serve these input supplies. But for import warehouses uh, and national distribution centers for OEMs and the like, uh, those were built where the first place you could find open space, out in the Inland Empire, between Chino and Fontana, around San Bernardino, over to Redlands, and now the latest area growing fast is uh, uh, out by Paris. Uh, and these are you know, a, a long ways from the ports. Uh, the domestic intermodal ramps, 
Uh, the ICTF is close to the, the near dock facility is there, and then they're on dock and right at the ports. The domestic intermodal terminals are downtown and on the edges of, of the inland empire. Okay, so uh, in 2015, uh, we had about 4 million 40 foot containers coming in from the Far East. Uh, uh, almost 2 million were in push uh, supply chains. Uh, and 1 million of those got on a train right at the ports. Uh, half a million were drayed to the local RDC, uh, which is typically in the Inland Empire or maybe in the East LA near downtown. Uh, another 0.2 million to the near dock facility, the ICTF. Uh, 0.2 million was drayed up to the downtown rail. That number is going down and, and will go to zero over the next few years as the rest of on-dock rail is completed. Uh, the push-pull 345 corner supply chains was a little over a million FEUs uh, and about uh, 0.7 of that was traded across docks or, uh, in the general area of the ICTF. Uh, and um, then from those cross stocks that generated 0.3 million shipments in 53s to the downtown rail terminals, about 0.1 million uh, to import warehouses in the Inland Empire, uh, another 0.07 uh, to local RDCs. Uh, and another 0.4 million went directly from the ports and drays to import warehouses. This is the stuff where we don't need it any, at any of our inland RDCs yet, so let's sit on it. You know, retail sales are highly peaked for a lot of goods uh, um, between uh, uh, about November 15th and January 15th is, uh, you know, much more, you know, two-thirds or three-fourths of annual sales. So there's a huge amount of stuff coming in way early. Uh, then the push-pull supply chains were all at San Pedro Bay was almost a million FEUs, uh, and most of that is draped to national distribution centers in the Inland Empire. There are a few large ones uh, around the ports in the ICTF area. Daimler Benz has a million square foot facility in Long Beach and so on. But uh, you know, the lion's share is uh, way out. Okay, so if you recap these things, is that uh, 1.6 million dray trips uh, from the ports or ICTF area out to Inland Empire. Uh, over a million from the ports to the ICTF area, a million uh, on dock rail. Now, to put that in context, uh, five day working week, uh, a million FEUs is about uh, 4,000 a day. So we're talking on the order of you know, 6,000 dray trips a day from the ports out to the Inland Empire on the LA Free. Point eight million uh, from the ports or the ICTF up to downtown. Uh, another point eight million uh, within the Inland Empire from the warehouse coming back to the railroad yard. Uh, and then there's even some stuff where uh, the train schedule they want to get on doesn't stop in the Inland Empire, so they drain them back to downtown. Uh, and then you need to add the empty return. You basically can double all these numbers for the empty return, and then there may be some repositioning moves on top of that to where we want to start the next round trip somewhere else. The Port of Long Beach uh, and Long Beach have done a lot of research on the emissions uh, from dray movements, from cranes, and so forth. Uh, uh, and I leveraged off that. I had some uh, <coughs> sub-consultants who uh, measured emissions of uh, trucks and trains and so forth. Uh, and then we calibrated this to the various trips I just talked about. Uh, and uh, maybe let's just look at the CO2 column. Uh, and so you can see like a, a dray from the ports uh, to an Inland Empire warehouse is 100, 144,000 grams or 144 kilograms. Um, and uh, the lift by a rubber tire gantry crane at the port is about four, 14 kilograms. Uh, you know, whereas uh, when the boxes are on a train, uh, it's a... Uh, See, 372 uh, grams per mile, right? So that uh, one lift by an RTG is about equal to 40 miles on the train. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the railroad 
is about four times less, even with that polluting lift, is uh, about one fourth the emissions of drain. Okay, so the, 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 what drove that intermodal geography is uh, uh, the import warehouses are you know, 60 to 80 miles from the ports, uh, uh, and that's where uh, the national distribution centers for the OEMs are as well. Uh, the cross stocks are close to the ports, but then you've got to dray them up to downtown right now. Uh, and so we add all this up, and uh, we have over 4 million dray trips a year and over 700 million kilograms of CO2 a year from accommodating these import supply chains. And I, maybe you've read about how the kids who live along the freeways are much sicker than those who live elsewhere and so forth. Is that, uh, you know, it's not okay. Now, it would be wonderful if all of this were one company, but it's not. It, you know, all these transportation is all broken up, and they, you know, if you look at it from their point of view of their contractual boundaries, what makes best for them, unfortunately, is never best overall. Uh, the ocean carriers promote staying in the marine box because then they make money on the inland haul, not just on the water haul. Uh, the ports have to be responsible to the ocean carriers. The ocean carriers pay their bills, that's where they make their money. Basically, the ports are landlords renting space to the ocean carriers. Uh, and also, they don't want the politics of having to take responsibility for inland logistics. The port is enough of a headache. Uh, and so they kind of echo their customers and promote IPI. Uh, the railroads are relying on others to sell the door-to-door -door transportation uh, for historical reasons and labor reasons. Uh, they don't want to own drays because that could get unionized. They don't want to run the terminals, because that could get unionized. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then their margins on what they charge the steamship lines are much more than uh, their margins with the intermodal marketing company. So they, too, promote the IPI. Uh, the third-party logistics rarely get contracts longer than a year, so they can't really make any investments. Uh, the environmentalists and local government are, in general, hostile to imports and wish it would go to other ports. Uh, but if they you know, tolerate it at all, they say that, oh, well, it's best if you just put the box right on a train at the port. Then we don't have the truck traffic and we don't have this so forth. Uh, and remember what we said, that that's actually overall a worse supply train in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, and the poor importers who need the cross stocks and import warehouses to enable push pull, uh, and they go talk, and these other people are trying to push stuff on them they don't want. Uh, the commercial real estate developers, much they don't want to have to environmentally clean up an old area. They don't want to have to knock down old buildings. They much prefer going out to the desert and do a greenfield project where you have less government and less stuff. They, you know, they're outlaying all the money to build it until they get a lease or a sale. They're financing it, right? So their, their objective function is to get it done as quickly as possible. So they, of course, will be encouraging people to go way away from the ports, not go close. Okay, so uh, in the last few minutes, I want to just quickly highlight uh, the four solutions and, that I propose. Uh, first is, is to be able to have domestic container service close to the ports so we don't have to dray up to downtown. Second is to have a train to all the marine boxes to the Inland Empire for the, those that are going to warehouses there. Third is to uh, do redevelopment knock down the little old warehouses and create space to build massive large warehouses near the port so we don't have to move it so far. Uh, and the fifth is what's called dray off from the marine terminals uh, to where the marine terminals control the dray out rather than the shippers controlling it and that reduces the amount of crane work in the ports and the emissions from it. So briefly, first, uh, the ICTF is an underloaded facility as Supply chains have just changed from push to push pull, uh, and so the opportunity exists uh, to put domestic container service. There is a little bit now, but there could be a lot more. Uh, and uh, there's about 360,000 box loads that are generated right there that are currently drained up to downtown. Uh, there's also about um, 70,000 uh, marine boxes uh, that are drained up to cross docks up by downtown, and if this service existed, I'd probably encourage the cross docks to move back closer to the ports. Uh, and uh, if all of that market were captured, that would take 800,000 dray trips out and 13 million kilograms a year, and would add 
four trains per day to the corridor. Uh, the obstacle is, is that this isn't attractive to the railroad because they like to have two-way halls in their domestic boxes and there's very few domestic loads destined to around the ports. And downtown is a much better centroid, so they would be looking at uh, the westbound shipments coming there and then when the boxes are made empty, they've got to move them down to the ports. So you have to have a train of empty move boxes to move them down. Uh, but I think with a public-private partnership where uh, if we gave the railroads hybrid or electric cranes at downtown in ICTF, that gets rid of a lot of cost for them and also gets rid of all the emissions of those dirty cranes. Uh, and then they might be willing to play ball. Uh, the short haul intermodal market of the Inland Empire is huge. It's about 6,000 boxes per day. Uh, and uh, then plus if you take uh, the cross stock domestic loads from there that are going to warehouses, uh, that adds another uh, 150,000 a year. Uh, and if all of this were on short order intermodal, that would take out uh, 2.6 million trips, truck trips a year and uh, almost 300 million kilograms of CO2 per year uh, and would fill up the Alameda corridor with uh, 12 trains. Uh, and there's a variance of that I, I won't go into. Uh, the obstacles of this is the railroad will not make any money on short haul intermodal because you have the cost of the lifts uh, and transportation rates are basically mileage rates, so you need to go a long distance to pay for all the infrastructure. Uh, there's no rail terminal that can accommodate this volume in the Inland Empire right now, uh, and the railroad shares tracks with Metrolink, so capacity is an issue. Uh, and so uh, my suggested solution is, is that um, we have a new publicly financed terminal in uh, the Inland Empire uh, with electric or hybrid cranes, and there's a little bit of support traffic at the port of the car, but that, that's already underway. Uh, there's a way to separate the Metrolink and UP on parallel lines so that we have the capacity. Uh, and then there's a way to have uh, uh, reshipment incentives uh, so that if customers use the short haul intermodal, then uh, the savings from that can be applied uh, to using long distance in the UP. And now the UP would be suddenly very interested because they now have a cost advantage over the competition and they can get the long haul business they can make money on. And I won't go into the details of this, I don't have time, but uh, there's basically two lines, the blue line and the red line, uh, and right now the trains are both share and they could be completely separated so that we don't have freight and passengers sharing the tracks. Uh, the one place where you could do, the public could do uh, an intermodal terminal is at the Ontario airport. The tracks go right there. There's a huge amount of land reserved for a future runway. Uh, Worldport LA used to totally control it, and so they could have done it, but now it's transitioning to local control. But under the rules of the game, they have to say in the future direction of what happens to that land. And so I think it's up to the public there is that would you rather get rid of 4 million dray trips a year, or would you, and, and all that CO2, or would you rather have a new runway? Okay, and if they choose this, then suddenly we have a tremendous opportunity. Okay? Uh, and I won't go through the reshipment incentives now, but uh, basically, uh, considering the savings compared to drain the boxes, you know, the rate on the railroad, uh, that's about $150 credit the shipper can earn, which if applied on a $1,500 shipment to Chicagoland, then suddenly the UP has a 10% price advantage over the competition, and suddenly they can start taking away the long haul business and subsequently so consequently, they should be very interested. Uh, infill is uh, where we, I mentioned already of where we now, instead of having the warehouses in the United Empire, we start building more warehouses close to the ports. There already are efforts growing in this direction. There's a huge Southern California Edison swath of line for the power lines going down to the ports area. Uh, those power lines could be put underground and open up that property for what is now being called freight villages, where we'd have all the new warehouses and it'd be a very, it's right next to the ICTF so we'd have very short truck trips uh, and that could, uh, that's even better than at hauling marine boxes inland is just do everything right there and then we don't, don't, uh, uh, and then, you know, remember it was 14 trains now, since we're in the bigger domestic boxes, it's only 12 trains. Okay, so I, I have to skip over because we're <clears throat> just about out of time. I'll mention dray off is that um, right now the uh, 
the people running the marine terminals do not know when boxes are going to be picked up. And the boxes are stacked up on the dock area. Uh, and so uh, a truck Dre shows up, I'm here to get this box, and oh, it's three rows back and it's underneath four. And so then you're paying longshoremen with a rubber tired gantry crane to get all these other boxes out of the way to get to that one. Uh, and these are very polluting equipment. Whereas if they were allowed to just take the top one off and dispatch it on a dray, then it's a top handler, which as you saw we have battery powered ones now, and it's one guy, not three longshoremen. Uh, and so the marine terminal's dream is if they could control the drays rather than uh, the receivers. Uh, there needs to be a financial incentive to, to do that, but uh, that would get rid of 51 million kilograms a year if uh, everything transitioned to that. Uh, Nobody wants to move on it. The ocean carriers don't are competing with each other for the Walmart business, so nobody wants to be first to say, uh, you know, we're, we're now going to raise the rate on you or have a lower rate on this option and so on. So I think it may require some public intervention like, like Pier Pass uh, to, to get the right behavior. Okay, so some combination of infill and short haul intermodal to the inland higher together with domestic service at the ICTF and the trade off is that we could cut the emissions from import supply chains about in half. Uh, and we could get rid of 4 million dray trips a year in the LA Basin. Uh, and, uh, you know, boat traffic would be a hell of a lot better down there. Uh, and it, I think it's a lot cheaper than double decking freeways with truck lanes and other idiot schemes. Um, uh, but will it happen? Well. I think there's enormous education of public officials and private company managers. There's very few people who see the big picture. I've been able to put this picture together. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Uh, they don't make the right decisions. Um, uh, and there's going to have to be a political consensus to do this, that we need to do it to save planet Earth. We need to do it to save the children in the LA Basin. Uh, and there's got to be the political pressure on the NIMBYs to say it's a great idea, but I don't want it here. Go do it in the other town which was the battles that had to be fought for the Alameda Corridor. Uh, and I think it requires a very big deal involving a public-private partnership. Uh, it's uh, very cheap for the public, I think. It can cost the private guys uh, nothing, and it can make everybody better off. Uh, but it does require that deal, and that's tough when you have so many stakeholders. Uh, so at any rate, uh, a little plug. Uh, there's been funding from SCAG, from Caltrans, from Ports, uh, from IGI at the University of Denver. Uh, all the private enterprise players have been uh, very cooperative with me, and I'm very grateful for that. They've entrusted me with a lot of confidential information. Uh, and, but I want to not hesitate to say that these are my views, and they're not necessarily the views of any sponsor or collaborator. Uh, you're welcome to send me questions or comments anytime. think it'll help at all with this problem. Is that the way the supply chains are, are divided up, nobody owns the dray and all the emissions don't come from the dray. Is there a price point at which uh, point like the cities in South Bay would say, oh, we want all these warehouses, we want all this and kind of 12 nibbies and that's there? Is there like a point at which it suddenly becomes profitable, a tipping point that you calculated? Uh, the attitude of all the little communities around the ports, the Torrances and Comptons and, and uh, Long Beaches and Wilmington's and so forth, is that uh, they don't want warehouses. They want uh, re retail malls. They want software companies. They want sports stadiums. You know, they want all the tax revenue from that kind of stuff. They want those jobs. And, uh, they look at warehousing as low density and truck traffic don't seem to realize that 
you know, it would actually be a hell of a lot more less emissions if these trucks stopped here in the warehouse in your town rather than going by on the freeway. Uh, but that's not the way they feel. Uh, and so uh, that's why I say we, there's enormous education of public officials required. Okay, well, I think we're about uh, out of time. However, I have one small box. It's a model truck. Yeah. <laughs>